Acts chapter 27, verses number 1. I'm going to skip through here in some verses and say a few words, and then we'll bring you a thought. We all know about this chapter. It's the wrong, uh, Paul and the storm. We've heard it preached so many times, so many different ways and everything, and said some good things about it. But uh, I'm going to look at maybe just a little bit different tonight. In Acts chapter 27 and verse number 1, it says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. In verse 2, the first part, it said, And entering into the ship. And then if you go down to verse 8, it says, And hardly passing it came unto a place which is called the Fair Haven, nigh whereunto was the city of uh, Alasi. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because of the fast, uh, was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the lad in the ship, but also of our lives. If you mark in your Bible, circle that word hurt. It said, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to live in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by means they might obtain to, to Phoenix and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, you can circle that word haven, life toward the south, west, and northwest. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, losing thence, they sailed by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempest of wind called uh, Ericlidon, Air, and when the ship was caught, and we could not bear up in the wind, we let her drive. And running unto a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat. And which wind that they had taken up, they used helps. You can circle that word helps. Undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, uh, strike sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest the next day, they lighten the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest laid on us, all hope that we should uh, be saved was then taken away. You can circle that word hurt, our hope. And verse 21 says, But after a long abstainment, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and this loss. You can circle that word harm. Then if you go down to verse 41, for the sake of time, it says, In falling into a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart struck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the vials, vials of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill uh, the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first in the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some in broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Now in these verses of Scripture, we find in the first verses that Paul uh, sets out on a journey. He heads out on this journey and for, between the between the, the first verse and the last two verses of Scripture, there's all kinds of things happened on this journey from one point to the other. And I want to preach for just for a minute on the strength for the journey. Strength for the journey. We're all on a journey. The day, in fact, the day you was born, uh, you started out a journey. In fact, the day you was born, not only do you have a birthday, you got a death day. Amen. Gave it to you the same time. You don't know when it's coming, but God does. Amen. Right. But the day you breathed your first breath and came into this world, my friend, you started on what we call the journey of life. Right. And between the time we're born and, and the time we die, I wish I could tell you that it's all smooth sailing, but it's not. And here in these verses, Paul's talking about, he's talking about hurts, and he's talking about harms, and he's talking about uh, uh, helps and all these things that they faced, and we can go through all of that and show you different things that he faced. But my friend, he uh, faced all in no, no way, uh, Brother Christian, he knowed when he got on that ship 
what all the things that he was going to face. Right. All the things he was going to go through. Right. Right. And the day we was born, there's no, we have no idea uh, what we was going to go through. Right. Uh, if uh, if I know something to think about, Doug, I was going to have to go through. I just wish I'd have died as a kid. Amen. But we don't know. And, uh, and the best we can do, the best we can do to do right, and the best we can do to even like our children, to protect our children. Uh, uh, Lexi's got a little baby born about the same time as theirs was, and, and she's so protective of that baby. And that's a good thing, but she's so protective, and she said, I'm going to make sure I'm a good mama, and no harm comes this baby. I looked at her, and I said, I hate to bust your bubble, but forget it. Amen. Right. The best you can do, and you ought to do. Right. But my friend, some things is just out of our hands, and right. hers is going, she's going to fall. And uh, I skin her knee, you know, and she's going to have all kinds of problems that face her in life. And so that's the way it is in our normal, natural life. My friend, from one point to the other, we're going to have problems and troubles, and, and we need strength for the journey. Amen. I think about even in our natural life sometimes, uh, people, you know, they take all kinds of pills and do all kinds of exercise and do everything out just to try and help themselves. And I was talking to a fella at Hardy's the other day and he told me, he said, you know, preacher, he said, I've exercised all my life. I said, I've eat right and done right. He said, now I'm 75 years old and I hurt all over and I can't hardly move and I get in the floor and I can't get up. Amen. He said, all that I put in was good, but it still didn't stop what was going on in my life. And so physically, we face a lot of things. Then I thought about spiritually. When you get saved, get born again, by the grace of God you start out on a journey amen from that point right there you start on a journey living for God and I wish I could be like a lot of these big time preachers you know that tells you when you get saved everything's going to be lovely and everything's going to be wonderful they told me that when I was pa started pastoring the first church they said preacher said boy you, you got a good church now and everything's going to be okay well I'll tell you what I pastored our four years uh, and my friend we had nothing but trouble uh, in fact I told one fellow, I said, I graduated uh, from college at, uh, at Fellowship Baptist Church. Uh, went there four years and faced everything I could face. Uh, but, you know, and I wish I could tell you in your life as a Christian life, everything's going to be smooth. God's going to work everything out. You're going to have to go through no failures and nobody's going to get mad at you. You don't have to have no heartaches and you're going to have to carry no burdens, but just don't work that way. Yeah. My friend, in our Christian life, my friend, there's going to be times that, that things is going to come in our life and we need strength for the journey, my friend, to make it. Amen. And so I, I thought about I thought about just the word journey. I thought about it just means traveling our passage from one place to another are traveling over or through. And so physically and spiritually, we're all on a journey, uh, my friend, that we're traveling. Uh, then I thought about the word strength. Uh, the word strength means being strong to afford endurance. Uh, power to resist uh, or power, uh, my friend, to overcome. Uh, and so we need strength in this day. Uh, you just can't say, somebody said, boy, I got a good God. He's always with me. He's going to take care of everything. Uh, take care of everything. And he is a good God, but sometimes, uh, my friend, you need strength on your own. Uh, sometimes you just got to have some strength, uh, and my friend, to make it through on your own. You can't depend, my friend, if you get in a mess, you can't depend on me, and you can't depend on your pastor. My friend, you're going to have to bear some things in your life, and you're going to have to have some strength. So I said, boy, we got such a strong pastor, and we do. Uh, I'll tell you what, sometimes I went through things, and Brother Doug wasn't around, amen, and my friend, he wasn't there. I thought he was just a phone call away but at that moment he wasn't there and so I'm saying you need strength for yourselves and so I thought about I thought let me just give an illustration I, I thought about when I was a kid uh, uh, my dad pastored over in Andrews North Carolina and that was farm country I preached a meeting a few weeks ago over there and it's all farm country over there dairy farms and when we was just kids we worked uh, on the dairy farms and went to school just kids and we'd haul hay and, and help milk cows or whatever 
whatever was going on, and we worked over there. Uh, and that, and we'd have, in the summertime, we'd go over early in the morning, and Miss Brown would always have breakfast. Uh, she'd have biscuits and gravy and eggs and sausages and bacon. She'd have everything. Uh, and we'd eat, and then we'd go to the field and work till about lunchtime, and we'd come back, and she'd have chicken and beans and taters and everything, and we'd eat again, rest an hour, and then we'd take off back to the field. Well, we had a boy that moved up there from Atlanta, uh, and my, he wanted to help us and started the church there or, or going to church where we was going and he won't help us and so he come over there one morning and, uh, to, and he, we ate was, was eating breakfast uh, he didn't like biscuits and he didn't like gravy uh, he didn't like eggs he didn't like all he liked was pop, little old pop tarps and cereal that's about all he liked uh, and, and, and I went forget Mr. Brown uh, he said uh, you better eat some of this stuff uh, I said if you don't said you won't make it to lunch uh, oh, he said this is all I like I'll eat this all my life uh, well we went to the field the first day brother Christian that he didn't make it an hour he's laying in the front of the truck laid back like that my friend about to pass out it didn't take him about three days and he learned to how to eat biscuits and gravy and my friend something to give him a little strength to make it and I'm going to tell you what you can't make it in this Christian life on emotions you can't make it nothing wrong with shouting but you can't make it on shouting I'll tell you what you better have some meat from the word of God you better have some things that will give you strength if you don't you're going to fail and that's why we got so many people in and out and up and down because they don't have the strength that my friend that they need to face this journey. So let me just give you some things and I'll try to hurry but <laughs> some things about this journey. First of all I want you to notice in verse number 10 the Bible said in verse number 10 he said I perceived that this voyage will be with much hurt. And I'm going to tell you what on this journey you are going to have some hurts. <laughs> Amen. He said, Paul said, I perceive. He said, I tell you, we've sailed pretty good right now. We just left that little, the nice place. But he said, I'm telling you, there's some hurts that's going to come in your heart and in your life. We're going to face some hurt. And I'm going to tell you what the best I can tell you, my friend, in your life as a Christian, you're going to face some hurts. I mean, you just can't help it. I wish I could say I've never been hurt before. <laughs> I wish I could say I hadn't hurt myself before. And I'll tell you what, I've faced some hurts and you faced some hurts some hurt and that's just part of the journey amen and my friend I told about that the word hurts means physical pain injury discomfort suffering or wounds uh, to cause uh, the damage or the stress uh, and my friend did, did you know hurts come from within I think about Psalm 55 Psalm 55 David said my friend those verses in verse 4 he said my heart is sore pain within me I'm going to tell you what, my friend, your heart's going to get broke. Your heart's going to get crushed. Uh, Brother Doug, I wish I could say when, when my boys was birthed in the fa our family, our two boys, uh, my friend, you know what? I looked in boys and uh, I thought, man, they're perfect like their mama. Amen. Uh, I thought, boy, them boys ain't going, they're going to be different from every other boy. But you know what? It wasn't long. Uh, down the road, them boys hurt. Uh, they hurt me and my heart. Uh, they hurt my uh, kid. Uh, my friend, the grandkids come and they hurt. Uh, and my friend, you go past your church and guess what people hurt you amen and your Christian life uh, people hurt you and my friend you're going to have hurts and Paul said hey this journey that you're on he said I hate to tell you but we're fixing to face some hurts a storm's going to come and my friend, we're going to face some hardship and difficulties uh, I wish my friend we could exempt that but it just can't happen amen so we're going to face some hurts uh, then I looked in verse number 21 he said after a long abstainers Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm. Not only there's going to be harms on this, hurts on this journey, but there's going to be harms. Now, hurts come from within. Harm comes from out. I looked that word up, harms. It means afflictions, uh, damage. It, it comes from the outside of ourselves. If you, in fact, if you'll read the same thing in Psalm 55, when David was going through all this, David said in verse number 12, For he was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have bored. Neither was he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. But he said, It was thou, a man mine equal, my God. We took sweet counsel. Did you know sometimes the most people that will harm you in your life is people that you go to heart church with? <laughs> Amen. Sometimes they're the most harmful people that you've ever met. Amen. You know what you got? You've heard this before. You can go down here to some bar somewhere and get in the bar fight and beat each other up, bust each other's nose, and when it's all over with, get up there and get another round and go right on down the road. You come to my friend Baptist and get hurt and get harmed, they hold it against you the rest.
rest of your life. Amen. He'll never get over it. Come on, come on, help me out. Uh, it ain't all just us. It ain't all just you church members. Sometimes us preachers are like that. Uh, my friend, if something happened, we tell everybody to forgive and forget, but preachers can't even forgive and forget. Amen. And we get harmed from the outside. We get harmed. My friend comes and hurts us and harms comes in our life. And my friend, we get to the place I wished I could say in my Christian life, I've never been harmed and I've never been hurt. I wished I could say in my physical life, I've never been hurt. I've never been harmed. But it just think that way. Amen. Come on, hell. Right. I, 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 I was thinking about this, and, and uh, the friend of mine, I met him when I, I got Parkinson's, and when I first went to the doctor, there was another guy that uh, had, uh, had Parkinson's. Had, we took the same test, same day, diagnosed us both the same time. We both walked in. My friend, they told us both had Parkinson's, and we walked out. And my friend, that's been a few years ago, and back in February, Brother Doug, I went up there, and he was there, and we had an appointment back to back, and he came in on a walker, I just barely couldn't move. Had somebody help him. Here I come a walking in. And my friend, my, my doctor looked at it and said, said uh, Mr. Goodson, uh, said the guy that looks in front of you, you remember him? I said, oh yeah, we've talked several times. He's the one that diagnosed the same time. She said, you know what the difference is in him? I said, what? She said, he went home and sat down and watched TV and look at him now and said, you keep on pushing and you keep on going. And said, that's what the difference is. I'm going to tell you what you can sit down. Uh, my friend, and think you're going to come through this thing my friend you better keep a pushing and you better keep staying faithful and you can't stand with God because my friend they're going to have to have some strength for the journey if you sit down you lose your strength but you have to keep going you have to keep pushing in the things of God and so he talks about harms that come he talks about hurts that come on this journey that we have then they look look down in verses number 20 he says uh, and when the uh, neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and small tip displayed on us all hope all hope that we should be saved were taken away he said on that journey there's hurts there's harms that come but here he got to the place my friend that he lost hope he said all hope was gone that they would be saved all hope that they was going to survive all hope that they was going to make it through that storm was gone you know there's a lot of people today who's lost hope <laughs> Just be honest, we COVID caused a lot of preachers to lose hope. Amen. Come on now, help me out. Cause a lot of Christians to lose hope. That's why they ain't coming back to church. That's why they ain't living for God no more. That's why they're not a part of the church. My friend, it's because they've lost hope and fear destroyed them. They got hurt with fear and harm's coming out and they've lost hope that God's still God. And my honest, let me tell you right quick. God is still God. He's still on the throne. The word of God's still true. Holy Ghost is still a moving. The grace of God is still real. I thank God I've been in this thing for a long time and thank God it's the same God that I got saved 65 years ago it's the same God I served 1920 or 2023 amen I didn't cost you nothing I just throwed a little commercial in there amen but listen he talks about hurts and heart but he gets to the place the, the, the word hope means uh, no hope means loss of trust loss of confidence loss of expectation loss of victory that comes from an exhausting efforts and they work they, hey, they done everything they could throwed good stuff away you know there's a lot of people throw a lot of good stuff in their way they could hang on and enjoy because <laughs> some nut preacher told them they had to get rid of that come on now help me out come on now <laughs> I'm not promoting television, but I remember when all the preachers preached on television, and now every one of them got them. Come on now, help me out. I'm telling you, if it's wrong, it's wrong now. Come on now. Used to preach on being faithful. Well, we ain't shutting the house down for nothing. Now they just have Sunday morning service. <laughs> and I go to some of these churches and have Sunday morning service. You know what the people tell me? Miss Kay will tell you the truth. You know what they'll say? Well, she said, Preacher, I wish our pastor would open up Sunday night service again. You know, so sometimes it ain't, the, it ain't the people's fault. It's the preacher's fault. And we've lost hope. And God can do anything. We've let the government tell us, that, my friend, that we can't do this. And it can't happen. And you can't build a church in these days. And you can't do a work for God. I'm here to tell you, God's still God. You can do a work for God if you want to do a work for God. 
There's a bunch of sissy back preachers now, amen. <laughs> I'm not just preaching. We got a bunch of sissy back Christian people, amen. Come on now, help me out, huh? I, I, I didn't mean to get on all this, but anyway, hey, David in Psalm 55, you know what he done? He hurt. He had hurts. He was hurt, and, and, and they was a complaining. And my heart sore paid. And he goes down and says, the enemies come against me. But he lost hope. In verse number 6, he says, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. Yeah. I just fly away and be at rest. He got lost hope. He said, I just find me a solitary place and I'd go off and my friend move and, and get away from everything. You know what? That don't even work. I told my wife one time, I said, I want to take let's take a vacation. I said, let's go somewhere that nobody knows us. I said, let's go somewhere we ain't never preached before. Nobody knows us. We weren't gonna do nothing wrong. We just want to get away from everybody. Ain't it good sometimes just get away from everybody? Come on now, help me out. That's what y'all do on vacation. I just want to get away, you know. Get away from church. Get away from Brother Doug. Get away from my family. Get away from the dogs. and Get away from everybody. Uh, and, and I told him, so we found this little place we was going to go to, Brother Doug. And we went down there and we got us a little place to stay, a little room to stay. And the first morning, the first morning I got up and my soul said, I'm going to get me some breakfast. I went over there and walked in the restaurant and a guy looked over and said, Hey, preacher, good, how are you doing? I said, Go home, get out of here. We don't want to see you. You know, sometimes we just feel that way. My friend, we look, but you know what? Here he said, Here this place has come. And you feel like you just want to get away. You just feel like you don't want to fool with nobody. You just wish all your church folks and stay home and you can preach by yourself sometimes. Come on now, help me out. Huh? Don't you feel that way on this journey? So y'all thought this journey, this Christian journey, was just a, a heaven and honey all the way. It ain't. <laughs> Somebody said, boy, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, hey, I, I done this. When I, back when I first started preaching, uh, your dad back there, we all preached together, Brother Kate and all us guys, we started out together. And uh, Brother Kate was my hero. You know what I said? I used to tell him, I said, they said, you're going to slow down. You better slow down a little bit and quit jumping and kicking and stomping. I said, I'm going to kick and stomp till Jesus comes. Said, well, I'm going to kick him, but I ain't going so high. And I pay for it when it's over. Amen. So what I'm saying is, you're going to get weary. But I'll tell you what, you just got to keep building your strength and keep going on in this journey because hurts is going to come. Harms is going to come. You're going to get to the place sometime you just feel like there's no hope whatsoever Amen. to change your situation or ever rise again. Amen. But then look in verse number 17. He said in verse 17, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. Well, I got to that word helps and and uh, I'm just country preaching. I looked at that word helps. I thought, what in the world did he put that in there for? And how in the world are we going to use that? And I got to looking it up. And I know you probably already know this, uh, especially you preachers. But I got to looking up that word helps. Uh, and the word help means to give assistance to or support. It means to give benefit or usefulness or improvement. It means to prevent from occurring. And so what they said is, we have taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. Well, I got to look at that up. And you know what that word help right there means? In ship terms, it's called frapping. F-R-A-P-P-I-N-G. It's called frapping. You say, well, what is that? I'm glad you ask. I'm going to tell you. I said, every ship, I don't know much about shipping, but I remember we used to preach down there in New Orleans that the ships, uh, we'd go on them ships and let us preach on them. And I always noticed, and if the preacher paid those pictures to it, they got studied it. Brother Doug, there'd be ropes laying around, big old ropes that big. There'd be some cables laying over here. And I, 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 I never would pay no attention to it, but after I got to study it, I got to thinking, and there usually most ships had at least five, at least five ropes or five cables, and they'd just lay there. Right? But when a storm come, or when they snouts the, the storm's coming, you're facing a storm, the direction you're going, a storm coming. Or all of a sudden, maybe the winds begin to blow and the clouds will get dark and they realize the storm was coming. They would take those ropes, those men would, Brother Doug, and they'd dive off the boat and they'd take it down under the boat and they'd bring it up and they'd wrap that cable around that boat and they'd pull it up good and tight and they'd wrap another one, five of them. They'd wrap them up and pull that boat up in good and tight, pull it together because the storm was coming and they was going to face the storm and they would wrap themselves up in them cables or ropes, my friend, to hold things together to get them through the storm. Yes, Remember what Jesus said? He wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Yes, I, <laughs> I think about my, my little granddaughter, Lexi. She got that little baby, and, and every time we go over, go around, she got that thing wrapped up. 
And she said, I'm fixing to get her to lay down and take a nap. And she's got her all wrapped up. I'm thinking, who can look to sleep like that? But that baby, if you don't take we kept it one day, three or four hours. And that was long enough. But we kept it uh, uh, three or four hours. And, and you know what? I was trying to get it to sleep. It wouldn't go to sleep. And I called Lexi. And she called to check on it. And said, I said, well, I'm trying to get her to sleep. She won't go to sleep. She said, take a blanket, Papa, and wrap her up. And she'll go right off to sleep. And you know what? I took a blanket, Brother Doug, wrapped her up. She just went right off to sleep. I mean, slip over her eye, just slip. And you know what? I got to thinking, that's what happened. That baby come from that mother's womb and is wrapped up in that womb. It found safe. It found secure. My friend, it felt peace. And the little baby, you can take that little baby here and wrap it up. And that thing will just, he'll just go off to sleep. And you know what? I'm glad. Thank God we need to wrap up some things in our life. We need to put some fragment on our lives. And my friend, ask God to help us. My friend, wrap us up. And my friend, I thought about this. This is my little message. I thought about this fragment this helps we need to wrap ourselves up in the word of God if you're going to make it this journey you better wrap yourself up in the word of God amen I, I, I'm a veteran and I, I have to go to VA I'm in crisis right now every Monday morning I have an hour class and if I can't go I have to do it on the, on the iPad but I'm doing an hour class every morning at the VA every Monday morning and, and, and I was talking to a, a fellow vet up there and he said he said you remember when we was in Vietnam we was in the same group uh, he said you remember when we was in Vietnam I said oh yeah I've been trying to forget that for 40 years and can't forget it uh, but I said yeah I remember that uh, he said you remember uh, and I, I never thought about this brother Doug that he said I like to have a, I like to have a spell at the VA. Yeah, he was just sitting there talking. He said, uh, 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 "Mr. Goodson, he said, you remember what they told us uh, when we got to Vietnam?" Uh, I, I said, "Well, they told us a lot of things." Uh, I said, "I don't really remember everything they told us." Uh, I said, "I know they told us to, to uh, you know, we're on our own, every man for himself." Uh, and my friend and told us a lot of different things. Uh, told us to remember our training. Uh, and he went on. I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "If you remember, uh, said they told us when we got there and we got off the plane." They said, when you go to your unit, they hand us Brother Doug an M16. He said, they said that M16 is your friend as long as you're over here. That gun you hold, said, that's your best friend. Said, you better hang on to it. You better keep it clean because that's going to be a day that the enemy's going to come at you and they're going to start shooting you. And it's made every man for himself. And said, the best thing that you've got in Vietnam is that M16 rifle. Boy, when he said that, I thought, hallelujah, and this war, uh, the best thing we got. Thank God is the word of God. Uh, I said, I'm glad. Thank God you better hug it. Uh, you better embrace it. Uh, you better memorize it. Uh, you better study it. Uh, you better read it. Because uh, thank God when we get to the battles, this is the only thing that's going to see us through. Uh, it's the word of God. You better just wrap yourself up Amen. in the word of God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> most, most people that's having a hard time going through storms can't handle it, don't have no Bible left. Come on now, help me out. Amen. But you better wrap yourself up in the Word of God. Memorize the Word of God. Know where things is in the Word of God. And my friend, let God, let the Word of God dwell in you richly, building yourself up on the most holy faith. My friend, listen, take this Bible, and my friend, use it as one of them cords that they wrap that ship. Just wrap the Word of God around you and strengthen your heart and strengthen your life. Come on now, help me out. huh? That's why it's important to read the Word of God. I don't know how y'all are. I'm, I'm just human like everybody else. But you know what? When I wake up in the morning, usually five, between five and six o'clock every morning, I wake up. And Brother Doug, I, you probably like this too. Uh, when, I, when I wake up, the first thing I always do is I go get a cup of coffee and I sit it down beside the couch and I pick my Bible up and I read a little while in my Bible. And it's just like an automatic thing. When I wake up, first thing I think about, I'm going to get the Bible and read the Word of God. It's just like a habit. It's just like part of it. My friend, you know what? I love it because this Bible, my friend, it's your own hope. In fact, let me just say this. In Matthew chapter 4, when the devil came against Christ, what did he use? Did he use shouting? No. Did he use some big evangelistic meeting? No, I'm not against that. He used the Word of God and the devil left him. I'm going to tell you what, the only hope you got when those hurts come and when those harms come and thank God when you look like you ain't got no hope, you better get in the Word of God and my friend, wrap yourself up in it because there's hope in this Bible. There's hope in this Bible. There's an answer for everything you face. Everything that comes your way, there's an answer for it. Every problem you come, there's a solution for it in the Word of God. Wrap yourself up in this book. See, this book makes a difference. You know, sometimes it makes a difference who says something. 
Wow. You've heard this before, I'm sure. It was like that little old boy that was a little uh, boy that was out there playing the road. One of them named Johnny and his sister hollered at him. Said, Johnny, get out of that road. Said, uh, you're going to get run over. And he just kept on playing. And directly his sister hollered, Johnny! You better get out of that road. You're going to get in trouble. You better get out of that road. Three times she hollered at him. Fourth time she said, Johnny, Mama said, get out of that road. You know what? He got out of that road. Boy, you can let everybody holler at you if you want to. But I'll tell you, when God from heaven hollers at you and says, my friend, his word, and gives you his word, thank God you can get out of the road. And thank God you can go on down the road, little father, because his word is true. You better wrap yourself up. Wrap yourself up in the word of God. You better wrap yourself up in a prayer life. I'm not talking about this lay me down to sleep stuff. Bless my four no more. Amen. I'm talking about praying. Amen. I was talking to a fellow up VA the other day. I was talking to a fellow, and, uh, and I just talked to y'all know me. I just talked to everybody. And old boy sitting over there, and we got to talking, and and I said, I said, you're a Christian? And he said, yeah, I got saved when I was young. But he said, I've been in and out of church and all this stuff. And, and, and he said, I pray. I said, you do? He said, yeah. I said, well, how do you pray? He said, well, I just pray. He said, sometimes I just say, hello, Lord. <laughs> You know, and what he was saying is kind of really kind of disrespectful the way he was approaching it. But I didn't jump on him, didn't say nothing. And I looked at him finally. We talked about 15, 20 minutes, and, and right before they called my name to go back. And I looked at him, I said, I'm going to ask you a question. And I said, Have you ever prayed and God said something in your prayer? He said, No. I usually just do all the talking. <laughs> Amen. Come on now. I mean, you need to pray. The old timers used to call pray till you prayed through. Pray till you broke through. And my friend got a hold of heaven. You better have a prayer life. My friend he talks about my friend men ought always to pray and not to faint. My friend James said the effects of fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Psalm 55, I'd have been reading in here. So he said, But as for me, I will pray morning, evening, and noon. I'll pray and get a hold of God. Hebrews said, Seeing we have a great high priest, it's already passed into heaven. Thank God Jesus sitting right on the front, right on the throne room of God. Right at the right hand of the Father, waiting on us, my friend, to pay our petitions before Him. I'll tell you what, if you don't know nothing else, you better wrap yourself up in the Word, and you better wrap yourself up in a good prayer life. Amen. 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 <laughs> Come on now, help me out. I'm talking about praying. Then I thought about this you better wrap yourself up in the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 The Bible said, be filled. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I tell you what, that don't be ugly here, but I tell you what, if you get full of the Holy Ghost, there's a lot of things you won't be doing. <laughs> Come on now, help me out. John chapter 14, the Bible says in verse 17, he talks about even the spirit of truth uh, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither north him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Amen. I got saved 65 years ago. As a little eight-year-old boy, I think that's right. Is that right, Mom? Sixty-five and eight. That's uh, what seventy-three. Yeah, I got saved. I was eight years old, but Doug. And the day I got saved, sixty-five years ago, the Holy Ghost came and lived in my heart. Right. Yeah. Right. He ain't left one day. Right. <laughs> I've grieved him a few times, pushed him aside a few times, but he's always been there. Amen. If you're saved today, the Holy Ghost lives in your heart. And just think, let me just tell you something. Everywhere you go, and everything you do, the Holy Ghost is there. And sometimes the things that we do to our bodies and some things that we allow in our lives, we are grieving the Holy Ghost and pushing Him here for side. Amen? Come on now, help me out. <laughs> Amen? Come on now. Hey, you know, some of the stuff that the world does, you can expect them to do it. Some of the stuff Christians do. And, and let me just say this to clarify myself, don't be ugly. But you know, what you done when you was an old sinner? Okay. But why do you keep doing it when you claim to be saved and filled the Holy Ghost? Why do you keep messing up your body? Why do you keep acting in sin? Why do you keep, my friend, giving in to temptation? My friend, when you got saved, when you got saved, God forgave you. Forgive all that. You can't have it. But when you got born again, why do you keep on doing the things that you used to do? Come on now. <laughs> you full of the Holy Ghost. Paul, when he got saved, he said, the things I used to do, I didn't do no more. Things that I loved, I don't love no more. You know what happened? He wrapped himself up in the Holy Ghost of God. Amen.
Come on now. And 50, uh, somebody said, well, I don't know what to do. Well, in John chapter 15, and my friend, verse uh, 26, he talks about in that verse, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send of the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he will testify of me. He talks about when the Holy Ghost is come, he will bring a thing, I teach you all things, and bring all things to remembrance. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, you know what? Read this Bible, God will teach it to you. Yeah. Right. Hello. <laughs> had a lady here a while back in church she said well I just don't I got me one of them other Bibles preacher I said well ain't one Bible you probably got another book yeah, yeah, right. but you didn't get a Bible right. and she said well I understand it so much better I said well you just told on yourself yeah, yeah. I said either you, either you ain't saved or you ain't full of the Holy Ghost right. because as the Bible said the Holy Ghost will teach you and guide you right. in all trust you know, it's one thing. It's one thing. But Doug got me to preach slow. But you know what? It's one thing. It's one thing for Brother Doug to tell you something. Yeah. 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 And tell the truth and grasp that truth. I mean, I got confidence in Brother Doug. I've never heard him preach nothing wrong. We've never had a crossword. And, but I can't go on what he says, right. even though he's telling the truth. Tell, and sometimes you see things because he's preaching. Well, I'll tell you what's good. When you're struggling with something, you get off back there in the corner somewhere in your back room and you get on your Bible lay it down the floor get on your face and go to praying and say God I don't have no clue what this verse is could you help me with this verse and but the Holy Ghost comes down there and shows you what that verse is I tell you you won't never forget it you won't never get away from it you'll remember the meaning of that verse for the rest of your life while the Holy Ghost will guide you and teach you in all traps I think, I think the Holy Ghost will tell you when to testify <laughs> some people get up and testify they kill them eating Amen. Yeah, right. Brother Doug said, anybody got a testimony? Instead of, well, I'm hurting over here, preacher. My dog knocked me down or something, you know. Kill it dead than a hammer. Come on now. Come on. I think he didn't ask you for a complaint service. And he said, anybody got a testimony? And they stand up and say, well, pray for my soul. He didn't ask you for a prayer request. <laughs> he asked you for a testimony. Amen. I mean, when I was doing back, uh, what, four or five years ago, I had some classes up uh, at, at the VA and, and, and went to them for, I got PTSD and A, B, C, D, and Z and everything else. And, and I was taking all that and taking them classes, trying to help me from for all the flashbacks from Norm and I was going through them classes and everything. And, 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 and every day, I noticed every time that the class would end, uh, there would be about 10 or 12 minutes, Brother Doug, before we was out. And he would just shut it off and, and he'd say, anybody got any questions or anything? And we'd have 10, 10 or 12 minutes left. We went through about three services, uh, three classes like that, and about the fourth class, he said, anybody got anything to say or comment? I said, yeah. And I just preached to him for about ten minutes. Yeah. And you know what he said? Come back to class next time. He said, preacher, you just every day, you got the last ten minutes of the class. Just preach to him. Tell us something about God. Tell us something about the Word of God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you what. The Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, preach just a little. And it opened up a whole door. Now you better wrap yourself up in the Holy Ghost. If you're a singer, don't I don't care. You can practice all you want to practice, and you you ought to practice, and some needs practice. Yeah. Amen. I'll tell you what, you better pray that God will fill you with the Holy Ghost right. when you sing. Right. Right. And when you preach, you better pray that God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. When you teach, you better pray that God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. When you're trying to help your children and give them guidance, you better pray first that the God will give you some leadership of the Holy Ghost, how to talk to them and how to deal with them. I'm telling you, he, you better to wrap yourself up in prayer. You better wrap yourself up in the Word of God. You better wrap yourself up in the Holy Ghost. Yeah, We're scared of that word. Yeah. I remember brother, I can't never remember his name. I call him Gother or whatever his name is over here. You remember preaching over here on the Holy Spirit one time here, Brother Doug, you remember? A dose of the Holy Ghost or something, you remember that? You can throw that in the way, I wore it out, amen. But but uh, listen, I, 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 I never will forget that. I'm talking about getting just getting a dose of the Holy Ghost in your heart and in your life. Some of you are afraid to because you're afraid what you'll act like. You're afraid what you'll have to give up. You're afraid what changes they have to make in your life. Amen. I know y'all want to get this so with so we can have count meeting, but this is the best I got, Amen. But you know what? You better wrap yourself up in the Word. You better wrap yourself in prayer. And I thought about this. You better wrap yourself up in the grace of God. And let me just say something here. There's more than saving grace. Amen? There's more. I thank God for saving grace. And you can shout till Jesus comes on saving grace. 
I'll tell you what, there's more to grace, more to salvation than just saving grace. There's more to just holler hallelujah, you don't have to go to hell. Yeah, right, sir. Amen. <laughs> Me and Miss Kay have been soon just a month so we've been married. We've been married fifty two years. And my, listen, when I got married, but Doug, all I know I was married. I was telling everybody, I told everybody, I got married. And they said, Who are you married? I said, Kay Gutson. I wasn't ashamed of her. I felt like I, was, I was proud of her and I was excited that they got married. But you know what I found out? There's a whole lot more to marriage than just a piece of paper that says I'm married. <laughs> and we enjoyed 10 years and 15 years and 20 years. But I'll tell you what, these last 12 years, 40 to 52, man, it's been like a different world. We're just like one. i tell you how dangerous it is. You get to thinking like each other. She said, I'd like to go get a hamburger. I said, that's what I was thinking about a while ago. <laughs> or she'll say, you want to go see the baby? And I said, well, I, I was just fixing to ask you the same thing. It gets scary sometimes, you know. <laughs> they know what you're thinking, you know. But you know what? It seems like you get more like one, and more like one, and more like one. And you know what? Boy, when you get in that grace of God and you get saving grace. Let me just throw this out right quick to you. Titus talks about saving grace, satisfying grace, separating grace, secured grace, schooling grace, serving grace. Ephesians talks about saving grace, for by grace are you saved. He talks about separating grace. He talks about sustaining grace. He talks about su su uh, substitutionary grace, sufficient grace, stabilizing grace, strengthening grace. There's all kinds of graces in the Bible and you ought to just wrap yourself up in more than just the grace of God of salvation. There's all kinds of grace. Amen. It's like cover. When you go to bed, some people don't like cover. More the merrier. Man, I, like, I don't like my feet out. My feet's got to be in and under the cover. I'll put the sheets on and I'll pull the bed spread up. Here a while back, we got towards summer and Kate took, we had two or three blankets on the bed. We're old people. You get cold. Old people get cold. And, and, and had all that honey and, and she burns up and I'm, I'm over there. I got five quilts all over top of me and my friend right in the middle of summer and I'm just having time, you know. And she told me, she said, what in the world? I said, listen. I said, bring it on. I'll take all the cover you got. <laughs> Amen. I sit on the couch. I got a big old, one of them big old blankets. I, every time I sit on the couch, it'd be 100 degrees outside. I'm wrapped up in that blanket. <laughs> feels, make me, I don't know, I feel secure. I feel warm. I feel protected. And I'm going to tell you what, my fit is a blessed day when I found out, thank God, there was not only saving grace, but there was sufficient grace. Uh, old Paul got saved over that chapter 9, and he rejoiced in that saving grace. Uh, every time he get a word, they say, you got any words to say? He Paul said, every day about the time I was on the road to Damascus, uh, and my friend, the great light shining around about, and God saved me by his grace, uh, and he rejoiced in that. But I'll tell you what, one day God said, hey, Paul, you think, uh, you think that saving grace has been good. Uh, you got that thorn in the flesh. Uh, I'm to give you some sufficient grace that my friend that you're going to find that you can carry yourself with a thorn and all that will carry you through. Amazing grace how sweet to sell that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but now I'm found. Was blind but now I see through many dangers toils and snares I'll have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe this far and grace that will lead me on. <laughs> you better wrap yourself up in the good grace of God. Better wrap yourself up in the fruits of the Spirit. Amen. And then you better, that's love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, man. Then you better wrap yourself up in the mercies of God. Where is it over in, in the book of uh, Lamentations, I believe it's guess three. He says his, his mercies is renewed every day. Every morning. As one fellow said, it's like making gravy. Got a little restaurant over home, they make a, they make gravy, brown gravy. I go over and eat breakfast because I like that brown gravy. Somebody said, that grand baby's going to put you in the grave. I said, that's a hard shortcut to heaven. Amen. I said, who wants a dry biscuit? I like gravy on it. Me and Miss Kay was sitting over today before we left. She said, she said, let's run by old Handy Burger and get us a little bite of breakfast. Had us see us through till we get up there. We'll get us something later. I said, okay. Went over there. And I sit down, and we, I go over about every day when I'm home. And the lady, she said, you want what you used to get? I said, yeah. And she, hey, she hurried up, Brother Doug. Next thing I know, but she had my breakfast sitting there. Two biscuits and gravy, gravy all over it, sopping gravy and everything. Set it right down. 
and there's enough people come in beside us and they sit down about four or five people she come over and said could I help y'all said first let me tell you we don't have no more gravy <laughs> I thought man I'm glad I got here when I got here <laughs> amen and all of them said oh no gravy what am I all no gravy and I'm thinking man you got to get up here to get this gravy and I thought about man wouldn't it be bad God looked up to it and I ain't got no more mercy and that girl, she told that lady, she said, if you'll come back in the morning, we'll break a brand new batch of gravy. <laughs> Ain't it good? God said, every day you wake up, he got a brand new batch of mercy. <laughs> he said, I can't you can't exhaust the mercies of God. Amen. It's every morning he's got a grace of mercy. I remember I remember when, when Lexi was going a few things, and, and I, I, I was telling him, preacher friend of mine he said I said you know I've been doing this and helping this and trying to help her you know she's in the gutter of Doug and, and I tried to help her and you know what he did looked at me I, I, I felt like poking him in the nose but I didn't he looked at me and he said I'll tell you what I'd do I said what would you do he said I wouldn't have nothing to do with her I'd mark her off and let her learn I looked him right in his eyeball and I said you know why you'd do that he said why I said it ain't your granddaughter it's mine <laughs> And I said, I'm going to show mercy and kindness and love to her. Yeah. And you know what? Through mercy and kindness and love to her, she's pulled herself up yeah. and doing wonderful. Yeah. Boy, aren't you glad? Thank God when we have trouble. Yeah. God don't look down and say, that's it. I'm marking you off. No. He extends mercy in our direction because he knows our frame. He knows who we are. I tell you what, if you don't wrap nothing else up, just wrap the good mercies of God. There are no Holy Ghost, the Word and prayer. I tell you what, it'll give you strength for the journey. Yeah. Well, let me close. If you'll notice, notice in this same chapter in Acts 27, it not only talks about hurts and it not only talks about harms and it not only talks about harms and, and hope, no hope, and helps. But in verse number 12, it says, And there to winter, which is in a haven. And if you'll find out over in the last the chapter, they landed on the shore. <laughs> yeah. Found that haven. God give them strength to make it all the way through the journey. Right. They found that haven. Boy, aren't you glad? <laughs> that, word, that word haven, this means a place of rest, yeah. a place of peace, yeah. a place of sufficient care, a refuge. Yeah. <laughs> and if you'll notice this, the Bible said in the last verse, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them had to swim in, some of them had to be carried in, some of them went on planks, but all of them made it. I'm going to tell you, guess what? If you're saved by the grace of God, we're all going to make it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ain't no telling what we're going to have to go through before we get there, but we're all going to make it. Yeah. We're all going to arrive on that shore on the other side, and we're going to arrive and be there. You know what? We've got reservations over there. Yeah. Right. I took my boy, I took my boy to, to uh, one of the UT ball games, and me and him went up there, and he wanted to go, and I said, well, I'll go. I'll just take you. So we went up there. I took Whitney and I took Kevin and I took Kay and, and uh, the boys enjoyed it and Kay said I'd just soon be home watching the old television in my, in my recliner. But I took old Kevin up there and they with me. Crowds everywhere. You know how it is. Have you ever been to a ball game? Say, it ain't a sin to go to the ball game. Say amen. I've been wanting to come up here at the Reds game. I like that. But you know what? We went up there my boy the whole time. We was down on what they call the strip. We was walking around the strip and had all kinds of stuff and, and we was sitting down there eating and Kevin kept saying, Daddy, we better get up here at the ball game. He said, Look at all these people. I said, we can get no seat. He said, man, look at it. I said, they're, pile, they're lining up at the gate. Daddy, we better go. I said, just settle down. Let's enjoy some of this stuff on the trip. I said, let's just don't run up and sit down. I said, you're going to get tired of sitting there anyway. I said, let's just look around. We looked around at some of the booths and things like that with the Christian. And he was a nervous wreck. He said, oh, man, we're going to miss it. We're gonna, we ain't going to get a good seat. Got up there and went through the gate and everything. Had the guy take went up there and got through the gate and everything. And I looked at him. I said, "Son, you've been fretting all this time. <laughs> I've had these tickets pretty good while. And these see these two seats right here. Anybody else can sit in that seat and we can run them off. Because that's our seats. We've had it reserved. Sixty-five years ago, God reserved me a place in heaven. And I'm just about there." <laughs> I'm getting old enough now. I'm just about there. I'm looking more on the other side. And now I'm looking back here what's going on. We're all going to reach that haven. We're all going to reach that haven. And I tell you, between here and there, you better have some strength. 
I give you this. I'm through. What I'm going to say that I, I talk about. I, I think I talk about Vietnam more than now than I did. Used to talk about it, but I was thinking about this other day, and I know I've said stuff about this before. And uh, if you don't want to hear it, just do like this, and uh, I won't hear it again myself. But I remember when Brother Doug went to Vietnam and, and didn't know what we were going to face. Had all kinds of training, but didn't know what he was going to face. And my daddy, the last thing my daddy said, he said, son, go, to, go, to, go be a good soldier, fight for your country, and come back home. That's the last words they said to me. And I went over there, got messed up, got shot and everything else, and didn't know if I was going to live or not, get out of there or not. That's either and there. I went all through all kinds of problems and in and out of the hospital, the world, back to my unit, and didn't know if it, in, in everything. And, and I never will forget. I never will forget the first sergeant come around, Brother Doug, and he said, uh, Sergeant Goodson, he said, uh, your time's up. You're going home. He said, get your stuff together. I said, you can have everything I got, man. I'm just going to the house. I ain't got nothing over here I want. And they put me on a plane, flew me out, and landed in Fort Lewis, Washington, went through all that process. And, and uh, my mom and dad picked me up and picked me up in Atlanta. We lived in Newport, Tennessee. They picked me up in Atlanta and drove me home. I was glad to see them. We hugged and fellowship and talked going up the road. Got home and had friends all at the house, church folks and different friends there at the house because I was coming home. They had a little get-together for me and everything. But it wasn't long, Brother Doug. Everybody left. Mom and Dad went to bed. I went back there and got in my bedroom. I'd been gone two years in that bedroom, <laughs> fighting the war, fighting for the country. And I laid down in that bed, and I can remember just like it was yesterday, in, the, in my own bedroom, just closed the door, laid down on that bed. And I said, I made it. I made it home. I'm going to tell you one of these days, thank God we're going to make it home. <laughs> We're going to make it. All of us is going to make it by the grace of God. We're going to make it. But between here and there, you better wrap yourself up. You better be some fraping in your life and get some strength for the journey. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.